Well, thank you uh, so much for, for the invite. Um, I was asked today to um, come and uh, talk about some of the um, COVID research projects uh, that, that we um, have in the lab and that we're collaborating with. Um, I'm a molecular virologist. Uh, I'm interested in how viruses replicate, how they infect. I'm also interested in host factors that prevent that infection, that try to block the infection. Um, I'm a uh, retrovirus spe specialist. I've been studying retroviruses and HIV for, for the past 16 years. And now with uh, this uh, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, uh, it allowed me to retool my lab and apply the knowledge uh, that we, have, we, we, we gained with the HIV to, uh, to another virus. So these are, are very exciting times. So the projects that I will be talking to you about today um, are funded by CIHR. So it's a big thanks to CIHR uh, for support, supporting this, uh, this research. These are the uh, rapid response funds that were released in March. Uh, where uh, my team received uh, $1 million to develop uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, um, and also a plant-based um, nasal spray vaccine. Uh, we also applied to the, uh, the latest June competition, but there's an embargo on the results, so I can't tell you officially if uh, we're funded or not. Um, but uh, through this, um, this proposal, uh, in, in this proposal, uh, we, uh, we were describing the, the establishment of a high throughput diagnostic uh, and serology testing platform here at UOttawa for research purposes. So as many of you know, uh, a lot of the diagnostics and uh, serology testing uh, in hospitals uh, were dedicated for the COVID-19 uh, clinical efforts. And there was very little room for research, large research projects uh, in, in those, uh, on those platforms in the hospitals. So what we decided to do is propose to uh, establish our own uh, high throughput diagnostic and serology platform here at U Ottawa, and we can welcome uh, large scale projects uh, with this funding. Uh, what we propose is a surveillance study where we're gonna follow a thousand people uh, over 10 months time and uh, look at their viral RNA, look at their, uh, their seroconversion for antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, those that seroconvert, we're gonna carry out some viral uh, neutralization studies and also uh, look at the T cell uh, responses. So I'm gonna go through all of these projects in, in a little bit more uh, detail now. So for, for the first project, um, as the, title of, uh, of the talk uh, indicates uh, we're very interested in, in antibodies as much as for therapeutics, diagnostics, and, and in, in terms of the biotechnology and, and, and for clinical applications, but also in antibodies that are naturally produced when uh, someone is exposed to the virus. So this first objective uh, is from our, our proposal that was funded uh, back in March. Um, in that proposal, we, uh, we, so we designed a study where um, we're planning to identify, develop a single domain antibodies uh, for diagnostic and therapeutic uh, applications. Now, what are single domain antibodies? Not everyone is very familiar with it. So um, I don't know if you can see the, the pointer. Uh, do you see the pointer? Oops. Yes, I do see the little arrow. Okay, so you see the mouse? Okay, yeah. so here um, on the left is a, a conventional antibody. This is, it looks like an IgG, and it has the classical heavy chain and light chain. So single domain antibodies uh, are, um, are basically a, a fraction uh, of, of those uh, full length conventional antibodies. Um, what's so particular, particular about them is that uh, they are naturally produced in camelids, so in camels and llamas. So instead of producing uh, these conventional antibodies, they produce antibodies that are basically only two heavy chains linked together. And when we talk about single domain antibodies uh, or VHH or nanobodies, what we're talking about is this just the tip of this uh, heavy chain antibody. So this tip here is what binds to the antigen. 
And if you, these, uh, these, uh, these regions here are um, easy to clone, uh, they're easy to express, uh, they demonstrate high affinity for their targets. So there, there's several advantages to um, cloning uh, such uh, sequences. And one of the, the biophysical advantages of uh, using uh, single domain antibodies is that they're very, very small. So they can potentially access epitopes that are not normally um, accessible to, um, to the larger conventional antibodies. So they, they, can, they can reach those um, deeper epitopes on the surface of the virus, which has definite uh, advantages if you, you wanna use um, these uh, single domain antibodies for diagnostic purposes. Uh, they can basically reach epitopes that are not under selective pressure uh, by the immune system and therefore uh, less likely to mutate and to evolve over time. So uh, in collaboration with the National Research Council, uh, we're, we're developing these uh, single domain antibodies. So how do we produce them? Um, in our strategy, what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be, uh, or we've already done this, we've uh, immunized llamas uh, with various um, uh, units of the surface um, spike glycoprotein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we've injected uh, the llamas with purified S1 domain, S2 domain, receptor binding domain as well. And uh, so we immunize the llamas and after a few weeks uh, there will be a booster shot. And uh, a few weeks after that we collect the blood from, from the llamas, we isolate uh, the PBMCs. Uh, then we clone uh, the, um, the genes coding for these VHH um, regions of the antibody. So we, we clone, we establish a library uh, of these sequences that we uh, then clone into a, a, um, into a phage display library. So the phages then express these uh, VHH uh, sequences on their surface. And then we uh, basically try to select for the, um, the, uh, the VHH or the single domain antibodies with the highest affinity to given antigens. So then you can plate at antigens of interest at the bottom of a plate. It can be the receptor binding domain. It can be the full spike, uh, full trimeric spike. So it is really up to, uh, to us to decide what we want to select. And then it goes through several rounds of what we call panning, where we, we just um, uh, apply our, our phages, uh, wash them out, amplify them again in bacteria, and then just go through several rounds of amplification to select uh, the, um, phage, the single domain antibodies with the highest affinity or with the properties we're interested in. Uh, then uh, once we've selected them, we can amplify them, we can sequence these regions, and once we've sequenced these VHH regions, uh, we can basically uh, produce them in, uh, in, uh, in cells uh, in, in large quantities. Now, for um, therapeutic applications, um, what is required is um, to actually, we need to fuse uh, to these VHH domains, a, uh, actually the, the heavy chains uh, or the FC domains of the antibodies. This will actually increase uh, the stability of these single domain antibodies. So uh, in our case, we will select a number of VHH and we'll fuse uh, the, um, I, the, uh, the FC region of uh, IgG1. So this will allow to uh, increase the stability of these uh, single domain antibodies. Now these VHH will also be used um, as, uh, for, for diagnostics to be able to uh, diagnose or to detect certain types of coronaviruses depending on uh, our panning strategy. So the, the ultimate goal of using these uh, single domain antibodies is for therapeutics. So one can imagine if we produce a large amount of them, uh, we can uh, basically uh, administer those single domain uh, antibodies in, in the airways, uh, in the lungs of individuals maybe that are in the acute stage of, of COVID-19 and help neutralize uh, the viruses. So we will select the, uh, the best single domain antibodies in neutralization studies in a level three facility at the, the NRC here in Ottawa. So the second project that, will be, uh, that, that we're running uh, is one where we're gonna look at the evolution of SARS-CoV-2. Now, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a beta coronavirus. It has a genome of about 30 KB. Now, something that is uh, not always uh, well appreciated, uh, I think, by the community is that uh, 
despite it being an RNA virus, uh, coronaviruses actually do have proofreading ability. So it's not a virus that will evolve as quickly as uh, influenza, for example, uh, that has uh, little to no proofreading ability. So it's not a virus that uh, evolves that quickly, but we are interested uh, in the laboratory to get a little bit more information uh, as to what are the bases that uh, are, are have higher probability of evolving over time um, and, and those the, the, that don't. Most of the information we have right now are on uh, SARS-CoV-1, the, the, the coronavirus uh, responsible for the epidemic in 2002, 2003, uh, and other coronaviruses. Um, there are seven uh, human coronaviruses, um, or seven coronaviruses that infect humans. Most of them cause the common cold. Uh, these are strains 229E, NL63, uh, HKU1, OC43. And the strains that actually cause the, the, the most severe disease are SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, that are beta coronaviruses of the lineage B. And uh, of course, MERS, uh, which is a beta coronavirus of lineage C. So what we'll be doing in the laboratory, uh, and also in collaboration with the, the National Research Council, uh, so that we can access um, a level three facility, and uh, Martin Pelsha at the University of Ottawa, who does the bioinformatics, what we'll do is we'll compare the evolution rates uh, of these seven coronaviruses in parallel uh, in tissue culture models. So every week, we're gonna passage uh, our cells, we're gonna harvest the virus, and we're going to enforce the evolution in uh, cell culture of uh, all seven uh, coronaviruses. We're going to perform uh, high throughput sequencing, and then we're going to look at mutations uh, that are caused by replication error. Um, we're looking at to identify positions that are more or less likely to get mutated. And also we're going to conduct infectivity essays on those viruses that have evolved to see if they're a gain of function, loss of function mutations. This information is important to understand how the virus replicates, how fast the virus can evolve in absence of an immune system or the, the, the selective pressure of an immune system, and can also help inform vaccine designs. There might be some parts of the virus that are much more conserved because they are absolutely critical for uh, virus um, replication. Then the, uh, another project from, from this uh, first, uh, first grant from CIHR is, of course, um, developing a, a vaccine. There are different ways of to produce vaccines. Uh, there's not a, a single uh, recipe. Uh, you can develop vaccines by uh, using the, the native wild type strain and simply inactivating it or, or weakening it through mutations. Um, you can also use uh, viral vectors, so either replicating or non-replicating viruses um, uh, upon which you express the, uh, the spike glycoprotein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's also now uh, nucleic acid-based uh, vaccines where you um, administer uh, either DNA or RNA from uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, with the intention of expressing some of those viral proteins in cells. Um, our approach is to uh, use a, a protein subunit of the virus, so the, the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and we intend to express it in plants, in Nicotiana benthamiana, which is a, an Australian plant, uh, it's a tobacco plant, that actually doesn't produce um, nicotine. So this is done in collaboration with a colleague here at, here at the U Ottawa, Elmar Altazar, that is here. Uh, and his research associate Jordan and the master's student uh, Brett. Um, so they will be expressing uh, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in these plants. Uh, and our intention is actually to induce mucosal immunity. Uh, many of the vaccine strategies that you saw on the previous slide um, are, um, for those vaccines are administered uh, intramuscular, um, they're injected. Um, what we wanted to do was a little bit different. We were thinking of um, higher to try to uh, to get a higher compliance of the general population for a vaccine. Uh, the general population doesn't like needles, or they're they, they, they're suspicious of vaccines. So we wanted to try a, a different approach and uh, develop a nasal spray vaccine similar to the one uh, developed for influenza. So we mass produced the viral spike protein in the plants, um, and then. Uh, 
we can administer that purified protein straight into the airways. So our intention is to um, induce mucosal immunity, so an IgA response. And the advantage of that is having a, a high titer of IgAs in, in, in the mucosal uh, tissues uh, of, of your airways will enable the uh, rapid neutralization uh, of the virus potentially so that the virus does not infect cells at all. So it will be neutralized pr uh, prior to, to entry. The other advantages of these uh, this approach is that uh, developing countries can produce their own vaccines. You can scale up uh, this type of production uh, immensely. And also there are fewer concerns when we're growing these, uh, these, these plants than uh, growing human cells and bioincubators. You're not as concerned about human pathogens being introduced uh, in that uh, production chain. Uh, also, when you're producing uh, large amounts of protein like this, the, the proteins tend to be more uh, stable at uh, ambient temperature. Um, the last concern here is um, this vaccine is potentially also safer than some of the other approaches. Uh, a great concern in the, in the vac vaccine field is antibody-dependent enhancement. Uh, this is where um, immunization with uh, viral antigens or with the virus itself uh, induces a, an immune state that will then uh, favor uh, or cause uh, more uh, severe disease symptoms upon re-exposure to the pathogen. Uh, this is still poorly understood. Uh, it's something that is on the radar for coronaviruses. It's something we've seen in, uh, in animal trials in ferrets uh, for MERS. Uh, and therefore, this is a, an important concern for vaccines. When you're, you're inducing mucosal immunity, mucosal immunity tends to be transient or short-lived. So if ever the vaccine were to uh, induce uh, ADE, um, that, uh, that phenomenon would, would just dissipate uh, over time. So here are some photographs of our plants growing at the Center of Advanced Research uh, in Environmental Genomics here at U Ottawa. So uh, we are already uh, growing up uh, significant amount of, uh, of these plants and our intention is within the next two weeks uh, to administer the purified spike protein to uh, Syrian golden hamsters, which will be our animal model to test uh, in infection assays. So the final uh, part of my talk uh, for the next uh, few minutes is to talk about serology. So this is uh, more focused on the second CIHR uh, grant that I, I mentioned earlier. So we have a, gr a great interest in, in serology and development of antibodies against the virus. So what do we know so far? So here in red is um, the curve of the uh, viral RNA. So uh, time zero, when you're infected, the RNA starts climbing, climbing over a number of days. Symptoms appear generally around day five. And in that sort of time frame is when you start being able to detect uh, the virus in nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, a few days later, around eight days, eight to 10, uh, this is when the antibody response uh, starts kicking in, you start producing IgM and IgA. So those types of those antibodies start climbing uh, up until uh, day about 20. Uh, at the same time, that's when it reaches the apogee. Uh, they start to decline as I, they, there's class switching, a somatic hypermutation, and then we see IgGs appear uh, about uh, day 22, day 25. So this is the, the, the general... Uh, understanding of, um, of uh, COVID-19 antibody response. What is unknown, however, is how long do we have that immunity? So uh, these antibodies can bind the virus. They don't necessarily neutralize the virus. Uh, that this is uh, one aspect. The second aspect is we don't know how long these antibodies will last or how long they can neutralize the, the, the virus uh, if they do neutralize. So serological tests help to determine uh, the levels of antibodies against the virus. Uh, there are, it's, uh, serological tests are important to, um, to measure what percentage of the population is actually exposed to the virus, and this is something we, we don't know yet. This will be very important uh, when we're going to be aiming for herd immunity when the, virus, when the vaccines come out. Um, another thing that we, we have very uh, little knowledge about is the number of asymptomatic individuals in the population, so individuals that are actually uh, have been exposed to the virus, have been infected with the virus, but just don't have any symptoms. Those individuals, uh, if they've been exposed, uh, generally will seroconvert and we'll be able to pick them up with serological tests. 
Uh, they help to track the persistence of antibodies and also uh, we can perform uh, antibody neutralization uh, studies. And finally, of course, uh, it's very important to um, track reinfections. So our study here uh, is to, um, to establish a surveillance cohort uh, of a thousand people, uh, participants and in at-risk groups. So we're talking about healthcare workers, teachers, staff and residents of retirement homes. And what we'll be doing is over 10 months, we'll be um, uh, testing them twice a month for the viral RNA and once a month for, for antibodies. We'll be testing against the uh, full spike, the receptor binding domain and the N protein. We'll be performing neutralization studies uh, with those that seroconvert and monitor the efficiency of the neutralization over time. And we'll also produce, um, we'll also measure T cell responses. So here's some uh, preliminary, preliminary data from our, our serology uh, tests that we've uh, developed here. Um, this is fresh data. This is data from, from yesterday, actually. And there, there were two in, interesting uh, patients here. Um, so what we collected the, the, uh, the serum and we uh, tested for IgM and IgG. So I'd like to bring the attention to patient PG and patient number 11. So PG uh, blood was drawn three weeks after symptoms, had fever, cough, difficulty breathing, no hospitalization, and was positive for RNA. So what we see here is we can see that uh, a nice uh, IgM response. And the, the IgG response is still uh, is, uh, detectable, but it's still quite low. This other patient, patient uh, 11, blood was drawn 16 weeks after mild symptoms, mild cough, loss of smell, never tested for viral RNA because wasn't very sick, self-isolated. And what we see here are very, very low levels of, um, of uh, IgM and very uh, high levels of IgG. Our test uh, it uses monoclonal antibodies, so we can uh, relate back and uh, quantify the nanograms per mole of serum. A question that I get often is, uh, what about all these false positives that we hear about? Uh, here's an example of a false positive we, we got last week. Uh, we had a number of patients we screened. They were all negative for IgM. However, one patient here, uh, patient 30, uh, showed a very weak signal for IgG. So our, our cutoff is, uh, is an OD of um, 0.22. And this uh, patient here had a value of 0.33. So therefore, he would be considered uh, positive for, uh, for COVID. Uh, however, uh, this individual tested negative for the RNA, no hospitalization, low fever, cough, fatigue, and the blood was drawn at four weeks. So this is probably an example where uh, there is cross-reactivity of the antibodies uh, to presumably another coronavirus. And, uh, Class switching and somatic hypermutation were required to increase the affinity of these antibodies because we don't see any IgM response in a very weak IgG response. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, a very large team is involved in all of these, uh, these projects. Uh, my, my own research team here at UOttawa, colleagues at the NRC uh, and, and UOttawa that are um, helping, uh, that are participating in this uh, large scale study. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that very fascinating information. Um, if anybody has questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat box now. Um, see, there we go. Uh, we'll give people just a moment to do that. Um, that was really interesting. I. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I don't know if I, it's a for me to ask them. I was curious, first of all, um, what, what caused you to choose llamas as your animal subject? So the, the camelids in general are um, the, the animals that produce uh, these, uh, these specialized antibodies with only two heavy chains. So theoretically, you can use llamas, you can use camels. Um, the general uh, approach to, to, to produce these, uh, these types of antibodies are actually llamas. There are uh, farms that farm the llamas for biotechnological uh, purposes to produce these single domain antibodies. So uh, you can get in contact with them and you can immunize the llamas. Thank, thank you for answering. Uh, Kathy asks this is, and says, this is very impressive. How does this serology test compare with others in development? 
So our serological test is based on the Mount Sinai um, test that was uh, FDA emergency uh, use approved in, in the US. Uh, we modified it. We're using different antibodies. Our, anti our antigens are slightly different. So it, it's, a, it's a highly optimized ELISA test. Um, the advantage of doing an ELISA over um, other uh, home, uh, uh, you know, all-in-one uh, automated test is that um, you can uh, modify the, the antigens. You can, you're not limited to what the, those uh, commercial tests uh, impose. So we, you can change the antigen. Uh, in our case, we were curious about uh, this false positive we, we, we got. Um, we can further investigate by uh, uh, swapping the antigens for a seasonal coronavirus spike proteins and confirm whether that false positive is due to uh, cross reactivity to uh, to seasonal coronaviruses. So, laboratory realizes offer a lot of flexibility. That's great, thank you. Uh, Fred or King asks, was there some sort of random selection of the n equals one thousand for the study? So, uh, so that study is, uh, is currently uh, underway. We, we are starting to, um, uh, to, to, to identify groups uh, of people that we want to recruit. Um, we are working with epidemiologists. Uh, we're working with uh, the REB to, uh, to earmark these certain groups. So that is a work in progress right now. Work in progress. Great. Uh, someone else asks, how well is trimeric spike expe expressed in tobacco plants and how easy is it to, to extract and purify? So I don't have the answer to that yet. We haven't started purifying it. Um, uh, our colleague Ilamar Altazar expects uh, a relatively high yield. I don't know what a high yield is at this stage. Uh, stay tuned. In two weeks, I'll be able to answer that question with uh, more accurate numbers. Uh, Adriana Suarez has a, a great question that I, I share as well. And so, uh, for the plant-based nasal spray vaccine, how would the dosing over time work? As you mentioned, the mucosal immunity is transient. Exactly. Um, so we'll need to um, conduct our own trials in hamster. Uh, establish the doses, uh, establish the safety. Uh, we're going to look at the immune response, the cytokine response, the antibody response. Now that we have the serological tests up and running, uh, we can now do those assays uh, in mice. Uh, we will uh, pay close attention to what was developed for influenza vaccine, influenza nasal spray vaccines. So there are some around. Uh, we also need to uh, consider different adjuvants. So there is a lot of development being done on, uh, on that side that needs to be done before we get a vaccine. Great, thank you so much. Um, and it looks like we're just about at time. So uh, since, since we don't have any more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and call it. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, everyone and thank you for your really super great questions. Just wanted to let you know that we are taking the Canada Day holiday off next week. So there will be no speaker series next week. You'll get an email that says that as well. Uh, but we do have several exciting things lined up uh, in the coming months. Uh, Valerie Tarasek uh, is going to talk about food insecurity in COVID and Dr. Ron Becker is organizing a panel on the Pandemic Survival Guide, a blog and game, which all sounds super fascinating. So tune in on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>